All right, well, let's get started. Thank you guys for joining me. I've got uh, Lisa B and David 51 Norman with me today, and we'll have some other guests coming on to be mentored. Um, so these are my mentors that I have. Um, thank you guys for being here. Hello, hello. Thanks for having us and me. Yep. So I'd like you each to give like a little intro uh, about yourselves, 51, um, uh, if you could maybe go first. No, we have to go with Lisa because ladies first. Okay, all right. Okay, and I am, I mean, on my Brady Bunch box, I'm up next to Jen. I don't know how I appeared to everybody else, but uh, my name is Lisa B. Um, I am a tour manager, typically. I, I also do a lot of different other aspects like um, decor and security and a variety of things, but mainly I am a tour manager. I've been doing, I've been in the business about close to 30 years to age myself. And I've I started at the bottom, now I'm at the top. That's that's kind of, and I worked my way up. It was not instantaneous success. It was a long, long road. What was maybe one of the key points in your career that really like allowed you to kind of take a step up? I mean, honestly, I'd say meeting Kevin Lyman, to be honest, I, we, we met on Lollapalooza and he, I just kind of proved myself to him that this is what I wanted to do for a living and he gave me he gave me a shot. So I, I'd say, you know, being in contact with Kevin a million years ago during all of Palooza was really a, a huge hand up for me. Thanks. 5-1? Uh, I'm David 5-1 Norman. I'm a tour director and tour accountant. Um, I've been in the business like 35 years. Um, I've worked with all genres of music. Um, I love being part of things like this because I also learn a lot of stuff myself. Um, the, the, your question, what was your second question, Jen? Sorry. Um, but was there a moment in your career that um, where you were able to kind of like elevate your career? What was something that helped take you from where you were to the next level? Um, I think it was probably the advice of one of my mentors. I had three great mentors when I was uh, coming up and um, my main mentor is a, a gentleman named Tom Barfield, who I still call to this day. He said, five one, as you're getting into this business, you need to learn everything, tour managing, production managing, accounting. If you could be a promoter rep so you can learn things from the other side, he says it'll make you more well-rounded. And he also said that it would also get your phone to ring a lot more instead of just, you know, just being a tour manager, or just being a production manager. So I think that was one of the greatest pieces of advice that I've ever gotten and has still helped me to this day. I couldn't agree more. I think that the more varieties of experience in this industry that you can get, the more opportunities you will have. I mean, we're not in a linear learn A and then B and then C and then you become a lawyer, right? Like we are learn all of these 15 different things and figure out how to mesh them all together. Um, to, to yeah, I would say you have to know a little bit about a lot of things. Like even if it's just a little bit about audio or a little bit about lighting, enough to, to like go out and address the issue if it happens. So I know a little bit about everything. I know a lot more about some uh, situations, but I know a little bit about everything that happens from, from start to finish of every day. I've also found that um, by doing a whole bunch of different stuff, it helps identify what you don't like doing. Uh, uh, people go, I want to work in, I want to work on tours. Well, that can mean 10,000 different things. Um, it helps refine, do you want a job where you're at a desk? Do you want to walk around all day? Do you want to interact with people a lot? Do you want to be like focused in your little world? I mean, there's so many different types of jobs on tours that you kind of have to start doing them to get a feel for what you like and what you don't. Yeah. Um, well, let's go ahead and bring on our first guest is Gabriella. Um, she's got her hand raised, so I'm going to promote to panelists. So she'll be on here in just a second. Gabriella, I put you on, but I see that your microphone is muted. Hi, I'm here. Hi, thanks Hi. for joining us. Um, I can put on my camera too if that's for you. Yeah, that'd be great. Hi, thank Hi. you for bringing me. Hello. I'm so nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. So you're um, in Miami, is that right? I am 
I was living in Miami, but right now I'm in Ecuador because my family is here and because of the quarantine and all of that, I had to come. But I'm gonna go back to the. I'm gonna go back to New York because I'm gonna stay over there. I'm gonna move there, um, in a couple of weeks. Great, welcome. That's where I live. So, yay. Great place. Okay, so, um, my name is Gabriela Dominguez. I'm I'm a senior in Florida International University. Um, I'm doing my last semester right now, and I'm doing a marketing degree. Um, I have a little bit of background in event production. I was part of the Sobe Wine and Food Festival for two years. Um, that actually made me, I started volunteering, and then I realized that I really like like production, like event production and all that. So that's why I decided to focus more on that and with my career. Instead of like doing all marketing, I decided that it would be better if I do like, I also love concerts, so that's why I decided that that would give me an insight of, like, tour production and how to manage talent. And, yeah, here I am. So you worked on marketing. You've been working on marketing, but then you also started working on uh, this uh, wine festival. And you are, you are you more interested in doing the on-site live events? Is that what I'm getting? Yes. I love concerts, so... I've been going to concerts my whole life and I always had like that like intrigue of what it takes to put out such a good show and like make fans feel like like give them a whole different experience once they are in, con in the concert so that's why I decided that it would be good to focus more on that. Awesome. Do you have specific questions to get us started? I want to make sure that we cover the things that you want to cover uh, before we start peppering you with questions. Yes. So as I'm graduating from college this semester, how would be the best way to be part of a tour production after Corona is over? Hmm. Um, what, what, I, what I always say, what I will always believe is that you have to be a big fish in a small pond, meaning you have to really show yourself locally, like find your local venues, your local, something that you can do locally and, and it, you know, become a runner, become, sell merchandise, wh whatever you can do to, sh to, to show up locally and, and get really comfortable there first. So that, that's always been my advice is, is to, um, volunteer your time locally if you can and if and if if there's a a paycheck that comes with it even better oh, i totally agree you. yeah i think that's great advice so you know whenever you're doing work you should be getting some value out of it and ultimately the value that you're going to want to get is a paycheck but when you're still in the learning phase what you're getting out of it is an education and an opportunity to network and connect with people. So you'll, you know, you, you will start out doing like, yes, volunteer for everything, put, get your foot in the door any way you can. And at the same time, be aware of um, when you have gained enough experience that then that should become a paid job. I think that that's something to be aware of as you, you know, move down the road, but certainly, Every even one day festivals, one day things that you can show up and um, that's it's a great opportunity to meet people. I'd say also to find a great mentor also to, and, you know, network and be a part of things that are like this because you can network off of other people that are on panels like this and don't be afraid to ask any questions because when I was coming up and I'm sure I'm the oldest person here today. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question because if you don't ask, you don't know. So always ask questions, just keep them coming. Yeah, I found even if there was five minutes that we were standing around backstage waiting for something to happen, I would use those five minutes to ask whoever I was standing near something. Yep. And it's all of those, I think all those tiny little moments do add up over time. So you're, what school are you going to? Florida International University. And is there um, a concert committee there or other um, committees that are putting on, like are, are there student run committees that are putting on live events of any kind? Yes, um, it was called SPC and I was also part of that. Well, before Corona happened and all that, I was part of for like a year. 
because I transferred there later and then I found out, so that's fine. That's great. Doing things like that, I think, you know, is an excellent exposure to the nuts and bolts of putting on events. Yeah, I've also had the opportunity to volunteer for um, Reverb and Headcount. Mm. Um, I also, I have also been part of the street teams um, for Revolution Live, which is a venue in Miami. Yeah, and great shows yeah. there. <laughs> I yeah, it's a really good venue, and they also work with the filmer in Miami. So I also had. I also work there at the at the at the venue, and I think that oh, and I also did an internship in events last fall. So I think that a couple of the things you said, street team um, working at other venues, I think that's such an excellent opportunity to once that your foot is in the door in that venue. Um, have you had a chance to talk to the talent buyer and, or the, you know, just the sound person, the bar manager, the general manager, and kind of pick their brain on the details of how they do what they do? I unfortunately haven't. But you, now you can, right? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Um, I think that that's, I think a lot of times when we have entry level positions, we feel like, oh, I'm. I'm, I'm just in this entry level position. But once you already have that connection with an organization by doing something with them, uh, people obviously love talking about their jobs. So uh, I think you know, take those opportunities to um, try to connect with the other people at the venues and kind of pick their brain. And you're more likely to then um, be remembered when non entry level jobs start becoming available. And more of the types of jobs that you want to do. So what kind of on-site event jobs are you interested in? Like on-site event? So if you like I, working at events, what do you want to do at the events? I like being backstage most of the times, like back of the house. Um, just like making sure that everything's prepared, um, always um, keeping an eye on the artists and the talent and see if they need anything, um, if they need my help in anything that I, anything I could do, I love to do that. And there's a lot of work in that. There's so many, I mean, I, I feel like life is festivals now and at every festival, there's always gonna be a, an artist liaison assigned to uh, to a group and so you know de depending on what type of festival you can go anywhere from like a Coachella to all the way down and there's always there's always going to be lots of work for people to to do talent wrangling and uh, uh, artist liaison and make sure people have what they need in their green rooms and you know make sure that they know where to park their bus and make you know all, all of the uh, the basics that that make it comfortable for somebody to be at a festival all day all day long so that's that's always a great a great position too and working with like you said like with local nonprofits, they always need help there's always volunteer opportunities so you volunteer for half of the day the rest of the day you get to see the show so it's kind of a you know win-win situation five one what tips do you have um i kind of like everything that lisa was saying um but to piggyback off of what she said earlier um, trying to find, you know, to network is like your local promoter, AEG Live Nation, our local promoter. Um, I would also try to different, even if, you know, different universities try to get with different university programs outside of your own also to see if you can kind of go and help out on their shows just like as a volunteer also. Um, And she's moving to New York. So upon arriving oh. in New York, what, what should she, what, what's the to-do list there for her? You know, it's, it, it's very hard to say during these times because, but once the thing is, once New York, once we're into our next phase, once we get to the next level, it's going to, it's 
gonna blow up, right? Like, so everybody's gonna wanna go to theater. Everyone's gonna wanna go to a show. Everyone's gonna wanna just be out all the time being participating in that. But I'd say just kind of, depending on where you end up moving, get familiar with all the, the local venues and, and what kind of shows happen there and, and you know, how to get there on the train and figure out, because you're going to want to always, always take that public transportation. That's the way to get around New York. Like, learn, I'd say something as basic as get familiar with the, the subway systems and figure out the venues and, and how to get there. And, and uh, just show your face, you know, that people need everything from ticket takers to ticket scanners to, you know, like I say, runners and, and, and uh, green room assistants. So get familiar with the venues, I would say, and what, what capacities they run at and, and what their next year looks like. Come look, look at their website, see, see what's coming up, see where you think, what interests you. And Gabriella, have you heard of this organization called SheIsTheMusic.org? Yeah, I was recently introduced to it. I know they were doing um, a mentorship program, but mm -hmm. they didn't choose me. Oh. Well, yeah. I'm going to put in a good word for you after this. Don't give up. Keep trying. <laughs> um, do you have any more specific questions? Um, yeah. Going back to like networking and all of that, um, I would like to know what would be the best way to approach someone without being portrayed like annoying or like if they are busy, like I don't know, like that's why I don't like I, I'm not sure when is the best moment to approach someone. Sure, there is a fine line, right? Like, don't you agree? Like, I find there is a fine line of between mm -hmm. between being bothersome or just being being curious but um you know we'll i'll get into this a little bit later but there there are uh there there's another app that i work with called meet hook spelled m-e-e-t-h-o-o-k and it's one-on-one -on -one, uh video mentorships that people can have so that that means it's based on their time and their availability so people aren't going to say they're available to speak to you or want to, if it's annoying, because that's going to be on their time frame and when it works for them. So look, everybody's got a lot of free time right now. Trust me. Am I, if they're in our business, more than likely they have a lot of free time right now. So this, I'd say now the rest of 2020 is going to be a great time to, to get some mentoring. I get a lot of college students who reach out to me and they'll send a general email saying, Hey, I'm a college student, blah, blah, blah. I'm in the, I would like to get into the entertainment industry after this. Could you tell me a little bit of your story, uh, how you got into the industry? Would you be willing to be a mentor? And, you know, nine times out of 10, I say, sure, you know, pick my brain, whatever's left of it, of course, but, um, feel free to ask me anything i'll do anything to help and kind of like jen you know she has her site where she's sharing all of these different and um spreadsheets and you know sharing the knowledge so i would say don't don't feel bad about reaching out to someone because i even at my age i still do it to people that i really respect and you know i'll just shoot them off an email and say hey i'm a tour manager i would like to pick your brain for five or ten minutes and you know the worst thing the person could say is no but the best thing they could say is yes. So once I get that yes, just hit them with all the questions because- The follow through. Right. So on Warp Tour, there's there was 800 people on the tour. And as the tour accountant, I, you know, I, was, I spent a lot of time at my desk. And I would have, the thing that I liked best was when people would come in and say, I know you're busy, so this might not be a good time, but is there a good time that I can come back and pick your brain for 10 or 20 minutes? And I would say, sure, between noon and six, that's my transacting hour, my interacting hours, like come back anytime during that. But I'll tell you, I was shocked at the number of people that came in and asked that and then never showed back up. So um, when people tell you that it's fine to come at a certain time or here's what will work for me, do, follow, do the thing that they said. Yeah. Um, so before we move on to our next uh, person, I want to quickly pull up your resume and show people mm -hmm. because I think that it, especially for a college student, I'm really impressed with how you organized it and um, it, it, and just, I thought you did a beautiful job on it. So I wanna- Oh, uh, thank you. 
I'm going to screen <laughs> share that. I do have an extra, you know, a little bit of an extra bonus as well, because I imagine you speak Spanish. Um, yeah. That's always a bonus. Like anybody who has a second language or third language skill is always a bonus. There's, there's lots of times that that's a really very, very helpful, right? So um, I left your personal details off of there, but I'm sure anybody that wants to hire you can find you. Um, I, I don't know if it's weird to put like phone numbers and emails up on this. I just don't know. Um, so first I see that you have your education up front, which I think is great at the point that you're at in your life, because especially in this industry, there is a wide range of how much education people have. So being able to kind of highlight that, that, that you are, um, you know, in college, that you're, you're clearly a great student working hard, like that's a great thing to have right up front. Um, I love that you have your relevant experience. So as you go on, you'll have what you will call a master resume that'll be many pages long. And then you will just pull out the relevant experience that applies to the job that you're applying for to make your one page resume. Um, mm -hmm. So I love that you have the relevant experience. And then you've specified that you have leadership experience um, and your, your other skills. And I think that you did a great job with the use of capitalization, bold, underline, bullet points, italics, those things all matter when visually presenting this information. I think that you did a beautiful job on that. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is it necessary? I mean, I know you said that like it looks nice, but would you recommend to like use a template like on Canvas and make it look like more creative or is more like what is on there that matters the most? I think that what you have on there needs to be able to jump out. So I think that the visual, visual presentation is important because it's a whole page of information. People sometimes don't read necessarily all of those details. So whatever mm -hmm. you can do to make, um, and as you get going on this, the bands that you work with or the festivals that you work on, um, having those visually jump out, I think is important. Um, so, you know, it used to be that resumes had to be one page. They had to be on white paper with black typing because they were physical pieces of paper. And then they would maybe get scanned. You would mail them to companies and they would get like, they had to be formatted like that. So they could like maybe get scanned in once computers were a thing. So now there's more flexibility. Um, what do you guys have any Lisa and Dit 51 tips or thoughts? I have I mean, one. I, you, go, you go ahead, please. Can you scroll back up to the top, Jen? Yeah. The only comment that I would have, and in this day and in age, I think it's not a good idea to have your home address on there, especially oh. email. Oh. I would take the, your home address off for, for safety reasons. That would be my only thing. But I love the way this looks, though. It's, it's impressive. And it definitely it looks professional. So even if it maybe looks a little bit more corporate or whatever, in our industry, if it looks a little bit more corporate, that says professional sometimes. Um, one thing that I'm seeing people go towards, and we'll look at an example of this. Uh, um, actually, maybe I'll pull it up right now. Um, is a resume website. So we're going to, here I'll have, uh, I have five ones pulled up. Um, once you have especially a wide variety of experience, finding a way to present that information online so that you can give people a link to your URL, you know, your URL link, um, so people can like kind of discover more details and information, you can get more creative on a website. Um, so I love that 5.1, you're saying who you are and what you love doing. And that like immediately tells me things about you and what you're aiming. Why am I here? I'm, I want to learn about like what, how you can tour manage, production manage, and what your what skills you have. Thank you. And then it's easy to navigate. You've got your experience. Your, your, 
the human side of you, you've got your dogs. Um, and so, you know, showing chronologically some of the stuff that you've worked on um, and in what capacity. This is like easy to read. You know, when, you've, when you're a tour, um, um, say like a tour director, tour manager, tour accountant, even on a traditional resume, you don't have to explain what all of the details of those are for every job you had that for. You know, having things grouped together and talking about your skills and then talking about who you use those skills with is a great way to organize that information, I think. Um, got some photos. And it's easy to find things. So I think that the, the visual presentation is really, really great. Thank you. On this. Um, yeah, your website is amazing. I love it. Thank you. Any last questions, Gabriella? Um, yeah, I would like to know what was the first position that made you realize like, okay, this is really what I want to do for the rest of my life? Lisa? Um, I think like, like you said, just being part of the, the big picture, I started what I was doing more front of house. I, I worked um, doing a lot of sponsorships, working with, with like, uh, you know, sitting in a booth all day, representing some like Spawn Comics or something like that. And I realized, okay, this is nice. I'm seeing it all happen, but I felt very confined and stuck to that space. And then as time went on, I ended up more back at house. And I think just being able to be part of the, the administration part of it said to me, this is more me. Like I'm more, I'm more like detail oriented with administration and, and artists as opposed to working uh, front of house type of stuff that just really didn't resonate with me so you just have to know what resonates with with you like at the end of the day if it is if it's like okay now my heart feels full I did something and I feel like I accomplished something at the end of the day that's that's what stuck with me mine was I was uh, I remember when I was like four or five years old I'd be banging on pots and pans driving my mother insane so I always knew that I was going to be involved in music. So I was a frustrated drummer. I played in lots of top 40 bands. I played in a Rush cover band for several years. And so I knew that I was going to be involved. And my father um, listened to every type of music in the house. You know, sometimes he'd be down in the living room reading his newspaper and he'd be listening to country Western music or he'd listen to classical or R&B. So we always had music. My mother played piano. She played clarinet. My younger sister plays drums and she plays piano. So we always had music going on in the house. So I always wanted to uh, be involved with music. But can I ask a question to Jen, Lisa, and Gabriella? Mm -hmm. What was the first concert you went to? Peter Frampton. Oh. <laughs> You'll get that. Most people won't even know what I we're talking about, I saw Peter Frampton, Frampton Comes Alive. Um, Van Halen, Right Here, Right Now, tour in 1993. And Gabriella? Mine, mine was One Direction in 2014. And I loved it. That day, I'll never forget it. Mine There's was, mine was Kiss and Uriah Heep when I was still in high school and I could not hear for the next three or four days. It was so ungodly loud. But I knew after seeing that show, I was like, I've got to be, I've got to do this. Amazing. Amazing. So, um, you know, Gabriella, if it's cool, I think I'll leave you on as a panelist. Um, I'm going to bring on our next person, Camilla. Um, but I'd love to have you stay on here in case you have questions or, you know, kind of this is my first time doing this style of workshop, so I, I'm, we're, we're kind of rolling with how this works best. Is that cool? No, thank you for doing it. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. Um, all right, Camilla, I am going to bring you on. Hi, you probably showed up muted and video muted. I see you're unmuted. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, 
Does it turn on my camera? Hello. Hi. So we don't see your video. But if that, if, but that's okay. Oh, there we go. Yay. Hello. Hi. Hi. How's everybody? Hi. I'm there. Thanks so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Um, my name is Camilla Batian. I am a Brooklyn Knight, a New Yorker, and I also consider myself a jockey of all trades. I graduated from the High School of Fashion Industry in 2013, and then I went to the uh, SUNY Plattsburgh of State, New York. Um, I, graduate, I studied television and video production, as well as audio and radio production and broadcast management. Um, after college, I decided to go into uh, internship, interning for uh, major networks just to get a sense of what a major organization is like and how things are operating between the talent side as well as um, the business side. And there's a, a third bucket that is escaping my mind right now. But um, long term, I hope to start my own organization and um, you know just help people find their way. Um, but in the short term, I, touring is so new to me. I just learned about this um, during quarantine. I was invited from uh, another Zoom meeting um, that Troy Carter had, and I decided to just keep picking up any nuggets that I found along the way. Um, I actually found Jen through David 5-1 from um, the workshop that he does with uh, the tour management people. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me and, and some of the things I'm interested in. I would love to go on tour and just apply what I've been learning and practicing. Awesome. Um, so you want to go on tour. What do you want to do if you were on a tour? Like in what capacity do you want to work? Well, Jen, can I just tell you that when I saw your tour accounting YouTube video, um, I was like really into that. I, I never really realized how much of a artist advocate I am. I guess I've always advocated for people, but I I really want to play with numbers and well, not play with numbers, not like that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, you know, just just work the books and and apply my budgeting skills and stuff. Well, I love to hear you say that because um, ultimately, as much as we all love music or the, the passion of the live performances, ultimately it's a business and it has to be profitable for it to survive. So having a strong understanding of how to make it profitable helps support all of the fun parts, too, the other fun parts, because I think the money's fun. So, um, well, initially, what questions do you have for us? Okay. Um... Hold on, let me pull up some notes that I took. This question can go for anybody, but uh, Lisa, I think I heard you mention something about um, lighting direction. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit about how you got into to lighting? I'm, I'm interested in cinematography um, and I would love to learn more about plotting and, and I don't know, working with artists in their vision. Sure. Well. For me personally, I have very, very little knowledge about lighting. Like my, my best bit of knowledge about lighting is hiring the best lighting director, right? Like <laughs> what guy is known as the best guy, like what I know about lighting. But look, at one point I, I used to, I think a lot of us have this uh, concept like fake it till you make it until when you're faking it so much, it, it's a disaster. Like I, I faked that I could do follow spot before with a very huge artist called Patti LaBelle. Some might know her and some might not. So I said, they said, can you run follow spot? I said, absolutely, I can run follow spot because I'm going to be on a headset with the lighting director the whole time. Easy breezy, move the light around. That was not the case. My headset broke. I was just doing my own thing. Major disaster, major disaster. So I was faking it until I didn't make it. And so lighting is uh, definitely not my forte, but but look, it, it's, it's major importance to the show. And there's some artists that you work with that that is their priority, How, you know, the lighting director. Some people start with, I need the best guitar tech or I need the best 
whatever the case is, a lot of the artists nowadays, that's, that's a huge uh, pivotal role in the show is the lighting director. So it's, it's all, there's always going to be a need for an LD either locally or touring. Okay, okay. And does Jen, David, do you have any thoughts um, on, actually, Lisa brought up a really good point that I, I kind of want to piggyback on off of, um, faking it until you making it, but also failing and trying to cope with that. Pat, do, does anyone on the panel have any stories about um, crashing and burning and then coming back up like, I, I got this? <laughs> I'd love to one. Um, I would say years ago, there was a band called Matchbox 20 that was huge at the time. And I got the call up to tour manage them. And I said, oh, this is it. I've, I've made it now. And I lost complete vision of what I was supposed to be doing. You know, I started, I wanted a bus that had an office in it. You know, I wanted this, I wanted that. And I was like, I completely lost all perception of what I was supposed to be doing. And so we finished the tour and then when we came back home, they were gonna start a second leg and I wasn't asked back. And when I got home, you know, I was kind of not salty about it, but I was a little hurt by it. But then I started sitting down and going, you know what, I, I didn't do a good job. I, you know, I really have to apply myself moving forward. So um, when I got the call for my next gig, I said, you know what, I'm gonna really hunker down and focus on what I'm supposed to be doing. So even though, um, I mean, I've gotten fired from a few other tours that, you know, you have to pick yourself back up and keep going. And I think we're in an industry where turnover, especially in touring, is really, really common. Like that happens a ton to everybody. Um, my advice is on the fake it till you make it is there is nothing wrong with asking questions. There's no stupid question. Now, it's stupid if you ask the same question five times. <laughs> that's, that's where it becomes a problem. Um, but if you don't feel 100% confidence in something that you feel like you should, there is nothing wrong with asking. So there, there is a balance there where you need to, um, you have a good sense for what should I get more information on? And if you find that you're asking the same things over and over, like that's a whole like different problem, but um, mm -hmm. you learn by by asking. And I think it's it's challenging at the beginning of a career when you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And so the more that you can just feel comfortable asking questions or I'll look into that and get back to you, or do you know how I could find somebody that could explain this to me? Or here's an example that I have as a tour accountant frequently, there's now 10,000 different ticketing systems. So you find a graceful way of saying, help me understand what I'm looking at on this ticket report that you gave me. Yeah. Is a way of saying, I've never seen the report from this particular ticketing system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talk me through it, right? Um, but I also get the gap. Right, so um, that, that's my tip on that. And I think, I think just realizing a lot of times things are not personal. Like sometimes it's a matter of a good fit versus not a good fit. Like, you could be working with somebody and you could be doing an excellent job but for some reason you know it's just not a good fit and you have to not take that personally and realize you know maybe the organics of this just aren't there so i it, not taking things personally is a very big lesson i think like okay maybe it, that just didn't work out for this reason and consider everything a life lesson not necessarily just a work lesson but a life lesson yeah Great. Okay. And then I wanted to ask another question about call sheets. Is it okay if I share my screen? Yeah. Are you able to do that? I, I see the option here. I can yes. try. Oh, yeah. Because if you're on as a panelist, so yes, you would be able to do that. Yeah. Oh, I'm having trouble doing it, but it's all right. But nevertheless, I wanted to ask about um, how much information is too much information on a call sheet? Or is there such a thing? I would say from my standpoint, too much information. I don't like to, on my call sheets, especially if you're doing after show travel, I don't like to list what city you're going to or what hotel you're going to um, because 
if you're posting those around the venue, anyone can like pull that off the road, off the wall and figure out what, you know, where you're going. And just for security reasons, I don't do, I don't put that on mine or I don't put down on my call sheets uh, for the, what hotels that the artist or the band or crew or the drivers are staying at for security reasons also. Yeah. Um, we use Master Tour a lot, the software. So people, I have it on there, but anything that you put around the venue, I would put basically just the times. Don't put any personal info that someone can kind of use it in a nefarious way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, uh, so I kind of, kind of you know, two ways. I tailor my, my day sheets. I have a day sheet I give to the artists. I have a day sheet I give to the crew and the driver. And then I have a day sheet, which is more of my run of show that I give to the venue that ends up with all of those, you know, the box office, wherever that is. So, so I just take similar to what we were talking about with master tour and I'll tailor the information that I want, because if I put too much information on a day sheet for the artist, they're going to ignore it all. They just want to know what time is press, what time is dinner, you know, what time is sound check? What time do I need to be on stage? They don't, they don't want to know about all the other stuff and they'll, and it's confusing, I think. Yeah. So, but the crew and the driver, however, they need to know all of that information. So I, I tailor mine specifically to who I think needs to know what, when. Gotcha. Thank you, Lisa. You're welcome. Other questions? Yes. Um, I'd like to ask about merchandising, if that's okay. So I was reading um, a Polestar article about Empire um, partnering with uh, an organization. I can't remember the organization, I'm sorry, but I'm happy to share the article later. Um, and I was curious to know if that's something that you all see artists actually taking a rein in on is, is I guess, instead of working Working with labels to, to sell their merchandising, will that be something that they take on upon themselves? And how can tour managers, you know, make sure that I guess they, those needs are met? Or is that something a business manager? I, I'm a little confused on merchandising, honestly. Five one, do you want to address how merch works, or Lisa? Uh, I'll let Lisa because that's a little bit out of my realm, so I don't want to comment on something. Um, well, at the level that I'm working with, particularly, you know, club style, um, uh, you know, 2,000 cap, two to 5,000 cap artists. When it comes to that level of artists, you know, typically you have your merchandiser who's part of your team, part of your family, because in my opinion, it's one of the most important positions on the road. You're handling great amount of cash and you have to keep track of inventory and to, and to be, fair a lot more artists are very 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 involved in their merchandise numbers now that's that's the profit for me i see that's where the big profit comes in selling selling merchandise and they have a hand from the very beginning like choosing the designs and uh creating the price points and um checking in nightly i mean the artists that i work with every single night at the end of the night they want to see the report about the merchandise how much you know how much came in how much went out where, where are the details of it what's selling best so i think artists at a certain level um you know up to a certain point probably the larger artists that five one works with maybe not so much maybe management handles that more or their business managers handle that more but uh, you know on a one to two bus tour the the, uh, your merchandiser is a very, very key component as far as the uh, the money goes and being hands-on on, on merchandise. That is, so that is. artists will typically, at, at a certain point, work with a merchandise company and have a contract that's kind of similar to a record label where they get an advance and the, um, the merchandise company is basically uh, licensing the the band's image and there's different levels of involvement on design but that merchandise company will take care of uh, potentially design um, you know what are the items that are being sold what are the price points they'll take care of um, procuring the the creating the inventory so like buying the blank t-shirts and then getting the t-shirts printed then they will mm -hmm. get those t-shirts shipped to a certain point on the tour and then there'll be a merchandise manager like Lisa's talking about on the tour that will handle 
uh, the selling and all of the reporting on site. So I actually have a merchandise workshop coming up in a couple of weeks. I don't think that I actually have that, the details on uh, the website yet or anything. Um, so there, we will deal with merchandise more in depth then. Excellent, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, and then I guess my, my last question before I uh -huh. keep on listening. Um, I, I was looking up this thing called TAIT. TAIT, is anyone familiar with it? T-A-I-T? TAIT. TAIT, okay, okay. Uh, any recommend, uh, I mean, any recommendations, do, is that a standard company that, uh, that most tour people or, or uh, there are, people do all like Lighting and sound production, right? Five One, you might know better than me. Um, I've used Tate, but now uh, there's Tate Towers that build sets yeah. and things like that. So I'm uh, not sure that's okay. separate than what you're looking at. Um, I, but, I was looking into automation and um, I was taking uh, their Tate IQ um, courses over the last few weeks. And so I just, I was curious to know if that is a is just is that standard or is that just some like a, a, a marketing thing you know but I mean it wouldn't hurt to help but I wanted to know like, what are some ways I could use it is stage plot pro I guess similar to to that company is it tate.com because I just googled it real quick yeah well it, it's t let me look at my notes excuse me I'm looking at, I'll put it in the chat, actually. Okay. So I've been taking their IQ stuff and learning cues um, and just doing different training things. With oh, them. yeah. Um, but if that company has some training videos, I, I mean, I, that's a well-respected company in the industry. Yeah. I, they, they know what they're talking about. Got you. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thanks. Will you, do you want to stay up? I mean, you can, can and, and can I show your resume? Is that cool? Oh, sure. Go ahead. I'll, okay. I'll actually turn off my video. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I thought you had a great resume as well. Um, let me find where. I love I love the way this resume is set up. It looks it looks great. This is kind of visually Yeah. It it like the the visual on it I think is lovely. So I love how you used kind of two columns. Um and again, like the visuals of like what jumps out at me. Um it is great, especially if you're looking for like tour stuff. Like I've heard of Afropunk. I know what a production office coordinator is. Like these, like they jump out. And um, I think that that would, if I'm just glancing at a, at a whole bunch of resumes, you're, I mean, which I did to, for this process, yours definitely like jumped out in a great way. Um, Thank you. Love that you have the education on there, other skills and abilities. Uh, volunteer experience, I think is wonderful to include on a resume because it shows that you are not just focused on your career, but you're focused on your community and, and, and giving back and, and being involved in, um, in ways that benefit other things rather than just a paycheck is what that says to me. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I guess, you know, that is a great point to make about the address. I, I live in public housing and so I wouldn't want anyone to, to show up. <laughs> so my door stops. <laughs> yeah, I, I live in Crown. I don't know if anyone is on the panel is from Brooklyn, but yeah, I, I would, I would, I, I wouldn't. But I know Crown Heights. I love this this resume. Yeah, I love the colors too. Oh, and I had one question. So it seems like you've got um, uh. You're doing some video production because you have a company that you're doing. Some yes, I am actually. And so, frankly, when I saw it like that, because you had emailed me, and that was in your um, email signature, and then mm -hmm. when I saw your resume, is I almost didn't connect you as the same person for a bit because it seemed like you were like a video production person um, more from 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 that. 
So mm -hmm. you're, you've got a lot of talents. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I wasn't sure if there was a question. Um, I don't know if there was a question. <laughs> <laughs> but I could tell you a little bit about one of my latest projects that I'm working on that I, I can share some, some stuff about. Um, yeah. I love documentary film. Um, yes, I love it. You love it? I, well, well, I love documentaries. It's my favorite. It's my favorite uh, medium of, of any kind of television. I love documentaries. Me as well. We could talk about some more of that, I guess, later. Um, I have a documentary film coming out. I'm not sure when, but it's about Black motherhood and some of the, the pains of, of being a mother and exploring all, all generations of motherhood. Because I think that that's something that I'm, I'm not curious about, but I see everything happening with gun violence in the, in the country. And I'm just curious to know how women are, are having those conversations with their children and how they're including men in those conversations as well. Well, congratulations. That's, that's something to be really proud of. Very, very cool. That's and also, uh, both of you ladies that are getting to end up in New York, like I said, I live in New York and not that anything's happening currently, but I do, you know, I, I work on a lot of festivals and when I come through New York, I will absolutely be reaching out to both of you to see if you'd be interested and come, you know, welcome to come down for the day and intern with me or volunteer. So you, you have, a, you have, we can make sure you have my contact info and we'll love to have you both participate in whatever the next thing I'm doing in New York is that requires a little extra help. Thank you, that will be really helpful. I love volunteering, so please call me when you have a chance. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, awesome. I'm always open to any opportunities to learn more, so count me in. And um, Camilla, put your website in the chat so people can go see the stuff that you have been working on, too. Um, that's so awesome. I, this has turned out to be like already. Like, I mean, this has just been such a great workshop and we're not even done yet. Like I'm loving this. Um, okay, so I'm gonna bring on Ryan, who is our um, third guest. I'm gonna put him up to panelist and it'll take him a second um, to get his thing unmuted. Oh and... yeah, how are you? Hi Ryan. Hear me, see me, all that good stuff. Yes, thanks for joining us. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jen and Lisa and, and Five One and David and everything like that. Um, I I think like a lot of other people here, you know, I, I latched on to kind of the Tour 101 um, program that, that Five One is involved in, and I've just kind of been going from there and finding all the other resources that are out there right now in this strange and unusual time. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, a little bit about me. I, I saw so I'm from Kansas City. Um, I lived in Austin, Texas for a few few years along the way. Um, I actually never really got into music. I mean, I've always been passionate about it. I grew up playing trumpet and cello and stuff like that, but I never really got into it professionally probably until about three or four years ago. Um, so I, I didn't explore a lot of those options in college with student promotion groups. And I actually know, Jen, I, did you do like scope at Iowa, I think? You Is that bet right? I did. Okay, I have, I have a few friends that had, that were involved over the years in that, um, and and I don't know when it started, but they had a big big program with South by Southwest, and that was one of the first places I started to work. So, I, I kind of came into it after after kind of that point in things. Um, I was working at a desk job. I was kind of in analytics at a tech company down in Austin, and I got roped into volunteering for South by Southwest. Um, whether it was a wise decision or, or not at the time, but ended up meeting some folks there and um, getting involved, eventually ended up working kind of seasonally for them and picking up at their gigs like ACL, you know, stuff down there in Austin as well. Um, and then I actually moved back to Kansas City about two years ago to take an opportunity kind of in sports. So I'm working in more of the live entertainment sporting region of things right now. So Full disclosure, I would have, I, I, I loved your resume, I loved your website, I loved your experience. There, so there was, there was lots of reasons that I wanted to bring you on. Um, 
but my husband's from Kansas City and him and my two sons are the biggest Chiefs fan in the entire oh, world. <laughs> so gotcha. talking about things that are identifiable jumping out at a resume, yeah. I mean, I was just like, you guys, this one's from Kansas City and <laughs> works for the Chiefs on on-field productions. Yeah. Um, so that it that certainly like was the thing that tipped it over the edge of like, well, we, I, I, and I love that you are doing production related things in sports and um, you know, the, my panelists and I are all generally focused on the concert industry, mm -hmm. um, but production stuff, 5k races, marathons, those are live events, you know, football stadiums, putting on a, a football game and all the stuff that you do there. Also, it's all the same skills and a lot of the same terminology and a lot of the same stuff. So I thought that it was interesting having somebody on that um, is a little bit more in the sports world. So Yeah, and I mean, I think for a lot of folks, when I was first getting into it, I definitely had tunnel vision on like music, 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 because that's what I was interested in, whatever it might be. But definitely a lot of opportunities out there to volunteer with like marathons and, and, and stuff that's just like more event and logistic based too. Um, but more recently, you know, I think being in the sports world, I, I kind of look back and I, it, I, I was more passionate about when I was involved with music just because of the underlying interest in the subject matter or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And obviously now that everything has kind of changed with COVID, once I started checking out resources like, tour management one-on-one in your classes and stuff like that I guess a, something that I want to get a better idea about because I feel like I'd be, a lot of these resources are like the accessibility to learn more things about this it was hard because you know I imagine tour managers as having a pretty grueling work-life balance at times I'm sure that's probably true you know there weren't opportunities to come on webinar, webinars and stuff like that as much as there are probably today um, but I was kind of curious learning more about kind of someone's first role on a tour and more often than not how how often on a tour that you're going on would you say that you have someone that is literally going on their first tour on that outing lisa you want to go uh i mean i think it happens often for me but again a lot of a lot of the tours that i do now i i kind of prefer to work in festivals but touring festivals similar to the warp tour so i also um, just recently, we had our inaugural year of a, of a small festival, kind of a spinoff of Warp Tour that was, um, it's called Sad Summer Fest, when, and indeed it is a sad summer right now, we'd have to say, as far as the business side of this goes. But, you know, we, it, it's a younger demographic. Um, so a lot of the times, we're taking a lot of new people out on the road because you, you want people... New York, loud New York going on. You know, we, you want to you want to bring people out and give them experience, pass on some of the your information to the next generation. Because how long, you know, how long can I do festivals? You wanna you wanna impart that knowledge to people. So I think I find often I'm I'm dealing with people and working with people who are going out on their first tour, and and that's usually in the role of like sponsorship i think that's a really big role to fill on the road is sp corporate sponsors or whatever the sponsor may be even if it's um vans shoes or whatever, whatever whoever that sponsor is they need people they need bodies to fill the space and that's where a lot of new people come in i i see i see most of the new people in sponsorship roles five one Well, if 5-1 wants to jump in, he will. Um, I find that every tour that I've been on has had somebody new. Really? So, yeah. you know, the, it, 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 it feels like, oh, everybody knows what they're doing at the beginning. Everybody knows what they're doing. Everybody knows what's going on here. I'm the only one that, like, doesn't know what's happening. Uh, because, but at the be especially the beginning of a tour, uh, even if you're not – on your first tour, you're new to that tour. You don't know who the other people are. I mean, it's like the first day of school where everybody's at a new school a lot of times. Um, so that, that feeling of like, oh, everybody knows what's happening here is, but me, like you just ask questions. Like, and I got asked, or I asked a bunch of dumb questions at the beginning. Like somebody said, do we need a ticket to eat? And I was like, what? I don't, do you need a ticket to eat? 
and they and they were like a meal ticket sometimes on tours you get a meal ticket so they know who's allowed to have the catering i was like oh no i didn't know what that is but now i know and no yeah. that's not a thing happening here um you know i think people get their first tours in, in on their first tours in such a variety of different ways i was on the promoter side and worked in an accounting office at a local promoter for years and really had to figure out how to get myself out of the accounting office and get onto an on-site thing. So the first time I was on tour was with Bob Dylan and Willie Nelson as a talent buyer. Not the normal way that most people end up on their first tour, but that's how it happened for me. Um, you know, lots of people start out driving their friend's band and kind of turning into a tour manager. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's just a wide range of how you kind of get on that first tour tour. And, um, you know, there, I mean, there's a couple of funny little things that people will be able to tell if it's your first time, if you get into the bunk and put your head forward oh by the driver. <laughs> I've learned, uh, even though I've, never, I've heard already. <laughs> so for, for all you out there that are going on your first tour, your feet should go forward. Because if the driver has to stop real fast, you want your feet hitting that wall. <laughs> okay. um, so, you know, there's funny little things like that, but everybody has been, everybody on tour had a first one. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know if that totally answered your question, but. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Um, I guess you mentioned something about, and I don't know if this has become more common, it's still as common, but I guess, you know, coming in, not having previously been involved in touring or whatever it might be, I guess the narrative I always heard like growing up or whatever it might be was, you were the TM and you were selling merch and you were maybe like playing bass in the band. I mean, I know that might be like a little bit dramatic, but like, so do you often see that is still probably one of the most common ways that people go on the first tour is if it's like a band tour or do you see larger opportunities like arena tours that have a lot more facets going on, like sponsorship aspects and VIP aspects and maybe stuff like that. Do you think, that is an entry point as well, or is it more common that it's kind of the first route? I find that uh, bands that are just starting out, if they're going on some of the bigger tours, the, okay. and especially if they're in van and trailers, you know, your tour manager is also like your front of house engineer, or it's also selling merch, or is also the production manager. When I got my start, I was the all-in-one guy, and I was driving the van, I was helping set up the gear, I was settling the shows and I was mixing, and I was mixing. So, you know, you have to be four or five places at once, but I, I tell you, it was hard as hell, but it, I think it made me more well-rounded and a little bit more patient at times because you learn to manage your time when you're doing multiple jobs. So I think you see a lot of that in bands that are just coming up. And I think that's a great, uh, learning ground to to be really good at what you're but I, I would never suggest trying to do two or three things but a lot of times you have to do two or three things nowadays yeah. I think it's pretty typical for front of house and production manager to share share a role often right um, and like you said if you're if, when it comes to uh, van and trailer that guy driving is also going to be tour managing, is also going to be setting up the merchandise. But at some point, you have to consider safety, right? If you have a guy that's doing all of those things, you, how is he going to drive you eight hours to the next venue? So you ha there's a level of, like, stretch it as far as you can get it out of one person, less people on the road, to a matter of, of safety. And, I, you know, you have to – sure, you could probably handle all those things, but is it safe? Is it wise? Is it, you know, caught – money and and budget doesn't doesn't involve risking people's lives to make that happen in my opinion yeah i think more special specialized jobs that have some technical skills uh, associated with them maybe haven't touring entry point at higher level tours um audio or lighting um you know, if you are looking to get on a tour, getting tied in with a good local promoter um, mm -hmm. and venue so that you and doing jobs like being a runner is one that you get kind of access to the tour manager. 
things that you can be working on site and make some connections with the tours that are coming through town is a way that then you can be remembered when they're looking for a production assistant, which is, I'm sort of guessing would be your entry point that you're looking for is probably more something like production assistant. Yeah, uh, probably something like along those lines. Um, the other kind of question I had, so kind of another aspect that kind of got me back into looking at music and touring and stuff like that was, I came across an article, it's, it was about Arna Jacobs at CAA and kind of the tour accounting side of the world. And so I, my background is math and econ and that's what I studied in school and that's what I did my first year kind of out of school and everything like that. Now, so I guess balancing, you know, I guess being on tour is obviously not like 99% of other accounting jobs. Um, you know, so where does that balance come in? Is it usually that's valuable, but ultimately you need the tour experience kind of before you can move into like a tour accounting role, even if you're really good with numbers or whatever it might be? Or, you know, is that a position that you ever have kind of an assistant role in? Or is it usually just like tour accounting and they take care of everything under that scope? Well, five one, jump in first if you want. Oof. Ah. <laughs> or, <laughs> well, ooh, that's a good one. Um, I have found that on tours, the tour accountant is just a tour accountant, takes care of all of that stuff. Um, I have several tour accountant friends, um, and that's their whole world. I, I've only been on one tour where the tour accountant has had an assistant, um, and that was more of a stadium run where you had to have you know, some, an extra pair of hands, but I, that's, I've just always just known the tour accountant. Jen, I think you can better answer this one. Yeah. So, um, I kind of agree with everything five one said. Um, I had assistance on the warp tour because the volume of transactions that I was handling, uh, there's just wasn't the amount of time in the day. Um, the thing that is really key to understand about tour accounting compared to other accounting out in the world is understanding what the numbers are representing. So yeah. understanding the production side and being able to inside and out uh, kind of understand what those numbers are representing so that you can accurately verify them and have intelligent conversations about them and why they are how they are. That's why a tour accountant gets hired rather than it being part of another job or whatever. So it's a very narrow, it's a narrow job, narrowly defined job, which um, nothing wrong with that, but it does make it hard to find uh, assistant positions or, um, and I came to it through the other side of the table. I was a talent buyer where I was settling shows with tour accountants and um, Ina Jacobs being one of them. And I just, during that time, I remember thinking, I would rather be over there than <laughs> over here. <laughs> like, uh, but there were things about talent buying that like I didn't like actually buying the talent, figuring out how many tickets were gonna be sold to uh, Breaking Benjamin and Fargo at what ticket price was like made my go head go like, I don't have a crystal ball, I don't know, and I don't wanna figure that out. Somebody else should figure that out. And then I wanna go on the tour and argue about how we calculate the tax and whether or not we should be paying for these towels. Um, so I think that the, the best way to learn things about tour accounting is to understand the production side of it and be able to see the paperwork that goes along with that. So a production manager is going to, all of those, all those invoices are gonna come across the production manager's desk. Take a look at it. Like as boring as it sounds to like look at invoices that you don't need to look at, that's, where it's connecting and then understanding the structure of the, the financial deals, which are in the real world, not all that complicated, um, but understanding the key components. If we spend more on this, what does it do to the artist payment? Who's really paying for this, the promoter or the artist based on how many tickets we've sold? Like that, understanding that type of stuff is, are, are the things that um, if you've got that basic foundation, you'll be able to step into tour accounting um, from being a tour manager from from something else on the tour okay. i think um i guess i had a question kind of specifically for for lisa since you had mentioned earlier 
that you were kind of maybe not I don't know the exact words that you use but like outside looking in you were kind of front of house type roles and you were maybe more interested in moving into back of house roles or something like that so typically any fest work that I do it's typically all guest services credentialing stuff that's more customer facing um, perhaps I mean so you mentioned I guess meeting and kind of connecting with Kevin Lyman at Lollapalooza was that a situation where you were just keeping any eye open for opportunities to you know you saw you were going into catering and like we're wanting to make that connection or was that just you happened to move into a different role and and met Kevin in that happenstance or? Um, the way that that happened was I, again, was trying to fake it till I make it. I took on a role that was way too big for me, a, a really big artist okay. um, that I'd met through a club that I worked in in Atlanta that we were talking about. Um, there was Lollapalooza happening and they needed a tour manager or a tour assistant. And I'd already been working locally for a very long time, putting on my own shows at BFWs and backyard skate competitions, whatever. So I ended up going on this tour in a, in a role that I was certainly not qualified for and, and absolutely could not handle the job. And it was overwhelming, but I think Kevin saw me and noticed that and helped me liaise to, there was a company at the time called Smart Drinks. It was like the original, uh, energy drink before there was ever another energy drink out there and they were pretty new and they, they needed somebody not only to like kind of run their booth but also be like a, a like an artist liaison like hey try this drink out so kevin i think saw me floundering and and helped me bridge that gap into like i think i can do this job and i can't but i'm not willing to give up so he helped me parlay whatever I thought I knew into a job that I could actually handle. And from there, you know, it, then I worked my way up. I tried to start up at the top and I wasn't qualified. So I had to go back down to the bottom and work my way back up. Gotcha. I'm going to throw in a bit of advice that Kevin gives people all the time. So this is 100% Kevin Lyman advice. When we have conferences again that we can go to or other events or things, uh, tours where you're, you're working at them, um, know who's going to be there that you want to meet, make a hit list of who you want to meet, figure out, don't stalk them, but you'll have an idea of when are they going to be kind of like, ideally you work volunteer at the panel ready room so that you are seeing all the panelists that come through. Um, and look for a good opportunity so that when you see them, you're prepared with what you're going to say to them, right? So you kind of know who you're kind of expecting to run into, and then hopefully you run into those people. Um, if they're off on their phone talking, like that's not a good time, obviously. But like, if it looks like it's an okay time to approach someone, then you've already kind of thought through, why do I want to talk to this person? What am I going to say to them? Um, so finding like those openings, but being prepared a little bit in advance for when you do have that opening, like, you know, I see, would see people all the time just be like, oh, hey, Kevin, I can't, I just, I've always wanted to meet you. And like, that's literally all they have to say. Yeah. And that, that's great. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not moving the relationship forward. Um, when it comes to networking, especially in, in things like this, like what, if you go in with the thought of what can I offer that person? Um, and I, I, I do this now, rather than going into any interaction going, what can I get out of it? I think about what can I offer, which is frankly why I started this workshop series. I want to offer something to people and something will come back in my direction. Right. Um, and that's already happened. Right. Rather than, um, going, what do I want from people? Figure out how can I help this person and how can I bring value? Because if I brought value to them, they're gonna find a way to you know, bring me along, get, bring, bring me some value, think of me when there's an opportunity, they know I have something to contribute. And, and that's something that people at any point in their career can do. You don't have to have had 25 years of uh, experience to, to come from that perspective, so. Um, gotcha. Yeah, I, I do think that was that was one thing that I had learned. I guess I had never pictured so many people, I guess, in the music or entertainment industry, like at con conferences or whatever it might be. But I, I do know that 
David had mentioned that on a previous tour 101 um, as well. So definitely something to look out for once people get back to that state. Um, I, that really answers a, a lot of the kind of questions that I had directly. Um, I, I know you asked about showing my resume and website and stuff yeah. like that. Um, Is that cool? Yeah, yeah, that's totally cool. If you're Great. So um, first I'll pull up your resume. You have a resume and a website. Um, pulling up the resume first. So I like that you also use, I mean, it's visually, it's clean, things pop out. Um, I can easily see that you have a lot of experience in ticketing, right? And you, you understand how to use uh, technology um, because you've mentioned the platforms that you can use. Um, seeing the words jump out like credentialing and stage manager, like, oh, you've, I don't even have to look at where those things were. I know that you've worked at events, you know? Mm. Um, having things like Super Bowl, South by Southwest, ACL, um, Lollapalooza, like these are like, you know, great identifiable things. Um, so, I mean, I thought that you did just a great job on your resume. Oh, I'm looking at it, but I didn't share my screen. Did okay, I? I was like, I didn't know if I just couldn't see it because I was on the, the other side of things or what? Sorry. Let's try that one again. Okay. Here we go. Um, all right. So those the, the, the things that I said. Um, love that you have the two columns. The things are really jumping out. Um, it's easy to identify some key uh, events that you have worked at that are impressive, um, you know, with the Super Bowl, South by Southwest, Lollapalooza, ACL. Um, so I like that you have the project experience and then the work experience. And I haven't looked at it super closely, but this is a good example of how chronologically isn't necessarily the best way to organize a resume. Um, grouping experience together even if it's not an ongoing thing you know if you did this chronologically uh, I, I don't think that it would have the impact so I, yeah. I like how you've done that it's difficult to I you know resumes in their traditional format aren't built for working with so many different organizations and stuff like that so right definitely and at some point if you've done credentialing for a variety of events you'll have your credentialing section. It'll, oh, you have several. You're actually doing the thing that, yeah, where you've talked about credentialing, you have multiple events that you've done that, and then you talk about what you did kind of collectively in that area. Same thing, you know, with kind of stage managing. Um, so really in our industry, when we do a ton of different stuff, and sometimes it's volunteering at festivals for one day, looking at how you can group together like things to make a bigger impact, I think it is key in, in putting together a resume. So I thought you did a really good job here. Appreciate it. Hopping over to your website. Um, so what, what I liked about this is, um, for one thing, it without, it, like it tells me so much about you just with this picture. You, 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 you like music, you're wearing van shoes and you have like skinny jeans on like that. <laughs> that tells me the to, general genre. To be fair, of, that's not actually me, although I appreciate you, <laughs> but yeah. You're making it look like it is. So whether it is you or not, it is on, on this context, right? Um, so I like that you talked about um, your, yourself and what you've done that you're an event manager, like even if you've done a variety of different jobs, giving yourself kind of one uh, or two kind of like titles, that just, explaining who you are up front, I think is an important thing to do on a website. Um, what I really liked though, was this section where you took your very different buckets of expertise and found a way to, visually lay that out where this tells me things about each of those things those areas but it's not busy and cluttered you did a great, I think a great job of like visually explaining some different sections of what you know how to do 
And then you've got some recent work experience. When I went to the, I've been to one Chiefs game. It was the only professional football game I've ever been to. Um, I've spent majority of the time walking around the stadium, like as an event nerd, like, Ooh, how are they setting up? Like, how is the flow of people in the concourse? And where are all the merchandise, merchandise stands? And um, it was fun. And then, you know, contact information. So like, I thought you did a great job on this. It looks super professional and like clean and modern and uh, nicely put together. Cool. Thank you. Um, hey, Brian, did you do this site yourself? Yeah, so actually, this is a lot of what I've been doing on the side is I grew up kind of like a tech nerd and my brothers were working that world. So I've just been trying to mess around with teaching myself how to code for the last little bit. So that's the product of, yeah, yeah. I use Squarespace, so it's just like, not I think good. I had too much time on my hands and I wanted to try to figure out something. But yeah, no, I totally, I, I, I had a Squarespace right before that as well, so. Well, sitting at home, not being able to work events, if, if I were you, I would reach out to all of the people that you want to network with who don't mm -hmm. have websites and uh, offer up your skills because it gives you sure. something to offer them and uh, they will have to look at your website at, at some part of that process, right? So being creative about how you get things in front of people, you know? Appreciate it. Um, so we had a couple of questions come in through the chat, um, one of which I just wanted to address before we were almost out of time here, so. Um, Shelby asked, or she said she's moving to Chicago from Indianapolis and transferring from a community college to Columbia College Chicago and wondered if I had any Chicago specific tips. Um, so for one thing, that's the college I teach at. Shelby, you should come teach my, take my class. It's called Producing and Touring Live Entertainment, um, if you're interested in that. Um, so welcome to Chicago. Chicago specific tips. There is so much music industry stuff here. There's so many venues. There are so many festivals. I'm, and by the way, in all of my workshop things, I'm talking about the world as though we are not in the middle of a pandemic. Um, because at some point we will be out of this and um, we'll have a different kind of uh, normal. We won't go back, but we'll go forward to something new. So um, in preparation for that, I'm assuming that, you know, I'll, I'll, the world sort of resumes. Um, so I would say get to know those venues, find, even if it's bartending jobs or you know taking tickets at the door, if you can get your foot in the door at any range of venues, small to big, that's, uh, that, that would be my, my, my first tip on that. Um, sorry, I'm reading the next question. All right, so I'll just read it out loud because I can't like read and think at the same time. I've gained experience with live shows working with iHeartMedia and I never expected to love it that much, but I really fall in love with it. However, my specialty is marketing and branding. How can someone in my position test the waters in touring and live shows when most of my skills and experience are in marketing? Ooh, that's interesting. Uh, Lisa or 5-1, do you have any thoughts on transitioning from like an office marketing job to... T getting a taste of touring? Well, I think you go, Lisa. I mean, I was just going to similar, kind of say the same thing. Marketing um, kind of parlays into a sponsorship role. Like a lot of, a lot of uh, major tours have a sponsor coordinator. Like we had one on Warped Tour. We had a, we had a couple, Kate Truscott, an amazing person, but, but, you know that that takes you from the desk to the road to to like see it through from from start to finish i always think there's you know touring festivals have a lot of roles that you don't even think about tour photographer sponsorship manager etc cetera, etc cetera. but I, I think sponsorship coordinator is a is a really good um a really good jump probably from the desk job to being on the road I would say also if you can reach out to some of the touring divisions of record labels because they're always hiring people like that and then they put those people out on the road also. 
combined in with that VIP experiences um, where there's VIP packages, a lot of times they will send, the, there's a meet and greet involved or, um, and I see a lot of people that do sponsorship management on, on tours that also do VIP management that also do merchandise. So those three kind of little sub worlds all kind of fall into the, the non-technical um, gigs that you can get out there that are, are interchangeable is not the right word, but I see people that do a lot of those uh, from one tour to the next. Um, all right. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining me today. Um, so for future people that want to come on to office hours, I am going to do this again and it'll be a different focus, different times. I'm sure I'll do another production touring crew again. Um, the next one is going to be more aimed at artists that want to pick the brains of managers and agents and talent buyers and in that world. Um, so I'm going to kind of hit on different areas, but I love having, um, this has worked out great. So I'm so excited. Thank you so much all for giving your time. Um, this will be up on YouTube as soon as I figure out how to edit videos uh, and post things. <laughs> Not my area of expertise. Uh, and so that, uh, but you will be able to find it on jenkellogg.com. So if you want to come into a future office hours, I do line the people up in advance so that I have things like the resume ready to pull up and um, know who's coming on and make sure that they're available. So there is a form that you can fill out there if you are interested in being either a mentor or a mentee. Um, I'd love to meet new people, so please fill out the form. That would be great. And Lisa and 5-1, especially thank you guys for your expertise and your time. And Ryan, Gabriella, and Camilla, thank you for sharing, um, sharing your, your stories with us. Thank Thanks you for so having much for having us. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. And you thank you for all your advice and feedback. You're welcome. Stay focused, everyone. Oh, and go get Lisa a meat hook. M -E -E yeah, I put it. I put it in there, right? I put. I didn't think I put it in there. I put it in there again. It's in the panel. Okay, great. There was so many. There was so much in the chat. I wasn't able to read it while it was going. So um, it's in there again. So it's a. It's a um, online one-on-one -on -one video mentoring uh, meet hook. It's an app. Check it out. There's. Uh, it's similar to this, but it's more one-on-one -on -one with the mentor of your choice. Everything from from sports to uh, tour managing to lighting, uh, if you want to learn drums, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's, there's a massive uh, group of talented people uh, looking to mentor. All right. Well, thank you guys again. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you next week.